Now to a little-known story of a relatively small group of rough-and-ready Australian soldiers and the remarkable exploits in Timor during the Second World War. Recruited mainly from the bush in 1942, these men became the first Australians to successfully fight using guerrilla warfare tactics. They were launching relentless hit-and-run raids on the Japanese soldiers months before the fighting began on the Kokoda track. They also proved that Japanese could not only be matched, but beaten. Their enemy dubbed them the men who came out of the ground, which is the title of a new book by journalist and author Paul Cleary. Paul is a senior writer with the Australian newspaper these days. Paul has spent a long time in the Canberra Press Gallery, but also time as an advisor to the East Timorese government, where I presume he came across this story. Paul, good morning. Exactly, yes. When we spoke three years ago, we actually talked about the, the, the commandos in Timor because um, of what they said about the landscape and how similar it was to Australia. So it's funny how we're talking about it again. And we'll, we'll come to where those, these guys train. But, yep. you know, we know about Kokoda. We know about North Africa, Tobruk, El Alamein and so. But we don't know much about the fight against the Japanese in Timor. I, I had no idea, really. It's a funny story, and I think perhaps it's been hushed up in a way because, um, in a sense, I mean, Timor was a, a neutral territory, and um, Australia and the Dutch forces effectively invaded that that territory in uh, December 1941 as a preemptive move because we thought the Japanese were were coming down, and so, so we it, invaded first. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We invaded first, and that that actually then had the effect of luring the Japanese. They had no plan of going to Timor because they wanted to stay away from it, as it was as it was neutral. So um, it's it's interesting. So it's not one that's talked about and um it's also because it was a guerrilla war it's um guerrilla war as you probably know is inherently um dirty and uh there's a lot of stuff that went on that um men that in only in their very later years in life they really wanted to talk about we'll get to those stories in a minute but uh guerrilla warfare was not really what Australian troops had been trained in and engaged in generally in the, certainly the First World War and the Second World War, had they? No, that's right. The British only set it up after the fall of Dunkirk. They set up the, the Special Operations ex- Executive and they um, then sent a, a group out to Australia to train our men. And so they went for these guys from the bush mainly. They wanted people who were, you know, knew how to live off the land, sort of what they call very rugged types. That, that they actually looked for farm boys. They actually went for farm boys. Yeah, they wanted very rugged types who could survive on the land. Initially trained to go to France to get dropped in behind enemy lines, and that all trained, um, changed when Japan came into the war. So tell us about, is it, do I say the second second? That's right, second second, meaning it's the second independent company that was formed. There was one formed before it, and it's part of the second AIF. That's why it's called the second second. So this group of soldiers, how many were there? And, and tell us a bit about them. Okay, there were 270 um, officers and men. Um, um, trained uh, with um, many, a lot more officers and and um, uh, machine guns and 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 demolition work. You know, they were, they were designed to sort of get dropped on enemy lines, blow up bridges, and and get out of there, that sort of thing. And um, so there were 270, but they were part of a, of a force called Sparrow Force, which was in uh, Dutch Timor. That was 1400, and this was part of this disastrous plan that Australia embarked on, dropping all these small forces of a thousand men on these islands, all overwhelmed by the Japanese. All wiped out? All they? wiped out. Singapore, Dutch East Indies, Java. A- out of 23,000 men that we deployed in late uh, 1941, only these guys kept fighting. Only these 270 plus about 130 who managed to escape from Dutch Timor as part of the main force of Sparrow Force. And that was quite significant, their achievements. I mean, the book opens, the prologue opens with the story of Private Mervyn Doc Wheatley, who is a shearer, horsebreaker, professional kangaroo shooter. He ends up a sniper in the second second. And you talk about how they first figured out how to do these hit-and-run raids. Tell us a little about that. Well, initially they weren't very successful. Initially they were sort of trying to engage the Japanese in in platoons and, and groups of 20 men, and that was just too many. And so I think after a while, they, after a month or so, they realised they just needed to get a few men. So this was a group of five men, never seen action before, who um, one day uh, they knew that the trucks were coming along this road, just decided to go out there and 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 uh, and, and and do their first ambush. So they, they kind of worked out very quickly that they couldn't do that. A couple of early engagements with these big sort of um, more conventional tactics, larger forces, and they and they suffered casualties. They they lost some um, five men in one of their first engagements. So they realised quickly that they had to be, um, you know, very nimble, hit very quickly, and then get out of there. And having the support of the Timorese as well was really important because they were able to get very close to the enemy. And so this is why the uh, the, the phrase "the men who came out of the ground." It's funny. It sounds like ninjas, really, but um, <laughs> but they just kind of would appear, do these flash strikes, and disappear again. Or the Japanese even said a lot of the Japanese who fought them said they never saw them. 
that these guys that they, they, they just come out of nowhere attack and then, and then go back into the ground and these 270 soldiers kept at bay how many Japanese soldiers and how many Japanese soldiers were killed in well, these? That's, well, that's interesting. Over the course, Actually. initially there weren't that many in Timor. Initially there was uh, there was just a, a, a regiment. There was a, there were a few thousand. Over the course of the year, as as we kept hitting them, and then the bombing started from, from quite a heavy bombing campaign from Darwin, and the Japanese thought that we were going to um, try to recapture Timor, and so they heavily enforced, reinforced towards the end of the year to the point where I think they had up to up around ten thousand troops, which is a classic. Um, objective of guerrilla warfare. It's all about harassing the enemy, tying up thousands of troops at a time when Kokoda was being fought. And these Japanese troops could have been on the Kokoda track where they could have made a real difference. So this so this presumably altered the course of history to some extent. Well, you could say that. I mean, I mean, I think they had, made, they had a really significant wrong. But also going back, think about this. In April 1942, just after Anzac Day, we discover when we've had 23,000 men captured, we've lost um, HMAS Sydney, we learn that there's this small group of guys up in the mountains of Timor holding out. And that was a tremendous um, boost um, to morale. And we learned that, is that the radio story? We That's le- the radio story. Yeah, this they, is a great these story. These guys had no radio. The brigadier, who was the, uh, from the conventional army of Sparrow Force, told his men in Dutch Timor to destroy their last radio. So they've got no radio. In they've a, got no nothing. They've much, got no nothing, they? basically. And, and they realise without a radio, they're stuffed because without resupply, they'll eventually run out of ammunition and medical, medical supplies. And most importantly of all, boots. The single most important thing they needed in Timor because of the craggy, rocky surface was boots, and they were wearing out boots. So um, these guys um, spent 10 weeks um, putting together this radio, and, and one of them actually had a, basically had a nervous breakdown doing it because they were under like, so much stress to do it. And they, um, they put it together. and Out of what? Out of bits and pieces, out of spare parts, out of old radios, out of radios that weren't designed, out of radios with a 30-kilometre range. They just built this radio. And they um, sent the signal back saying, you know, for, force intact, still fighting. Um, the I, What struck me here was the sort of hearts and minds campaign these soldiers went on. You talked about they, they forged this relationship with the local Eastern Marines people, which is startling in itself, considering, as you say, they invaded, they drew the Japanese here. The bombing campaign basically yep. obliterated Dili. You might think there'd be some resentment towards these soldiers, but the East Timorese helped them out. They helped them with supply lines. They like their ears and eyes exactly. in, the, in, the, in the fighting and in the bush. Why? Why did they? Because these guys from the bush um, got to Timor and they, they were just, you know, typical guys, guys from the country, friendly, outgoing, and they treated the Timorese with respect. I mean, the Timorese had been treated not really as, as human beings by the, by the Portuguese for centuries, you know, treated as really second-class people. Um, and suddenly these, you know, easygoing Australians, um, the Timorese bow as they pass by the road and the Australians reach out and shake their hand. And most significant of all was, was that they treated the women well. And, um, and this was a country that had had, you know, armies that had been running around the place for, for hundreds of years, um, misbehaving and and early on that one of the the, the british consul the, the consul who was appointed to Dili in late 41 told the men if you really want to make sure you get on well with the people treat the women well and that really did did pay dividends the fact that they were pretty well behaved unlike a lot of other forces in 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 this theater and paul you referred to it earlier on but uh, let's get to it because guerrilla war is a phrase but it, it was actually a dirty war, wasn't it? Well, no, it was, yeah. I mean, the Japanese... There were civilians killed in this war from both sides. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what happened, the Japanese, after about six months of being being um, hit, hit by the Australians and, and really running around in circles, launched these militias from Dutch Timor. It's amazing how the similarities between 1999 with militias. So mm. they raised these militias, brought them over the border, were torching villages. And they also had a, a program called Phoenix, which um, resonates with the Phoenix program in South Vietnam. I wonder whether it actually inspired it. I don't know that, but it's interesting that they've got the same name. So this Phoenix organisation, which was an intelligence organisation, a bit like the CIA in South Vietnam, knocking out um, uh, village chiefs and other supporters. So then we actually started do it, copying their tactics. And there's a few instances, particularly towards the end of the year, where um, we were raiding villages and uh, we were burning down villages and um, people who were deemed to be on the other side were, were killed and some of them may have been civilians, I don't know. But um, and there also were instances of assassinations as well, of people who were seen to be on the other side. Paul, we must go. Time is nearly out. But uh, do you think... A lot of us might not know this story, but there is a strong bond between East Timor and Australia. 
is to some extent this a part of that and that the men who fought in Timor and the Timorers who assisted them, those bonds remain strong now? Yeah, no, it's pretty amazing. Seven years after this conflict, you've still got a connection. The families are still going up there. The families are connected. Um, and I think it really does come out of this this, this incredible um, support that the Australians got you know, and really did you know, help us in our, in our real hour of need. It's a great yarn and an important chapter in our war history. Paul, thanks very much for joining us. Okay. Paul Cleary is journalist and author, and his book, The Men Who Came Out of the Ground, is a gripping account of Australia's first commando campaign. It's published by Hachette Australia. It's 27 past eight.